It's December 5th, 2022. This is Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 221 of Rook. Western media are doing PR for the regime. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam dustan aziz. Durur bashama. And this is what it's now come to. The bizarre and sad spectacle of major English media minimizing the revolution in Iran and promoting the talking points of the Islamic Republic. It really needs to be believed to be seen. Western media are doing PR for the regime. To recap, it's been a sad 48 hours where big companies like the New York Times have peddled a fabrication that morality police are being disbanded and that this represents a concession from the regime and a victory for those not wanting anything extreme. And this was on the heels of 11 weeks now of spotty and skewed coverage of what is actually a revolution. Full-on periods where there's been nothing at all in Western news, despite children being murdered every day, and a full-on humanitarian crisis in play. Western media assisting with PR for the regime. Oh, we notice. Iranians in the diaspora have been counting every mention, aching for every last bit of Iran-focused attention. And let's be fair, there have been some good articles, some helpful reporting, some passionate TV pieces, and the occasional supportive editorial. But overall, mostly crickets. And when there has been coverage, it's been about some ongoing protests or turmoil in Iran. How many Western media outlets have actually called this what it is? A full-on battle to get rid of a terrorist theocracy. And that's where, if you'll forgive us, an agenda seems to be in place. That's where major Western media outlets are showing their face. Why not inform the world that a revolution is going on? Why not tell people about the depth of the commitment to change for the people of Iran? Is it perhaps that some media outlets with one ear listening to Western leaders who really don't want to change to the norm, the other ear to regime-sponsored Iranian lobbyists in the West pushing for reform, have something to gain by portraying this murderous regime as one with which you can still make an appeal? Perhaps do a nuclear deal? The story at the top of the New York Times website yesterday was also propagated in other major newspapers and cable networks. Had anyone done any modicum of research, they would know the story was untrue. But that wasn't the point, was it? What exactly was this headline meant to do? Western media are doing PR for the regime. Oh, it certainly served as a distraction. With all the atrocities being committed by the terrorist regime in Iran, how about a prominent piece about accommodation meant to soothe the masses? Did it matter to any Western editors that no Iranian looking for change is hungry for a fucking morality police solution? Did it matter to the owners of these publications that the people want a full-on revolution? Imagine what the story could have been in that same space without the apologists and reformists occupying the Western media base. How about brutal Iranian regime continues its daily executions of innocent people? How about Ayatollahs continue to pursue policy of fear by murdering children? How about three days of national strikes begin inside Iran because citizens and workers want the regime to be gone? Any of those headlines and stories would help an otherwise uninformed and well-meaning Western public understand that whatever something they've heard is going on in Iran is actually a revolution that requires the attention and support of the world. And Iranian sisters and brothers, don't come at me with we don't care what the West thinks, Iranians will do this alone. The fact is, international pressure and isolation is not irrelevant. But of course, we don't need the West to save Iran. We just needed to stop saving the murderers. Shame on the New York Times and the Western media for not doing your due diligence and keeping people in your employ who will happily advance these lies. How about you start telling the world the truth about Iran before yet another child dies? Or would that rock the boat a little too much and create a storm? Would that hurt your noted aspirations for reform? We have another edition of our Uprising series coming up with lawyer and activist Elika Laban, actor and producer Nicole Ansari Cox, and our Rook Roundtable. This is Rook, episode 221, The Uprising. Western media are doing PR for the regime.
right, here we are. Another edition of Rook in the Rook studio in Toronto. Coming up in just a little bit, Erica LeBon. She is a British-Iranian criminal defense lawyer, a social justice activist, and someone who's been very active in social media of late, providing a lot of information and important context for what is happening in Iran uh, and events during this revolution. Erica Lebon joining us in just a, a little bit. And... Nicole Ansari Cox. She is an actor, a director, a producer. She recently attended the International Emmy Awards with Woman Life Freedom written on her skin. Uh, It was written just below her neck very prominently. She joins us to talk about how she's been caught up in supporting this revolution from her home in New York. Uh, By the way, she's also the wife of the great actor Brian Brian, Cox uh, of Succession fame. Uh, big fan of his and a big fan of hers as well. So I'm looking forward to her coming up on the show. I should say hello to you, Shia. Hello, Shia. Hi. And hello, Pega. Hello. Our Rook on air team during this uprising series. Uh, by the way, before we get into our roundtable and then our future guests, I wanted to mention that next week, so I guess a week and a few days from now, a week Thursday, we are releasing our latest documentary. Uh, yes. This is part of the Talking to Persians series, although this is a very different one from the, the London Talking to Persians. This is uh, when we were in Istanbul last month. Uh, the, the documentary is called The Revolution from the Backyard of Iran. Mm-hmm. It's talking to Iranians in Istanbul during this period of the uprising of 2022. Uh, and can't really, can't wait for the, the world to see it. Shai has been diligently... Uh, <laughs> passionately editing at all hours uh, mm-hmm. to try and get this thing done um, and uh, we're all excited to get it out the door and and um, really kind of express uh, a different side of um, the the movement in the diaspora uh, we, we sometimes talk about the diaspora as a monolith yes. uh, and it really isn't in the mm-hmm. sense that it's it being an Iranian uh, in Toronto or in LA uh, even though those are not uh, exactly the same either, or DC is very different from being an Iranian in Istanbul mm-hmm. uh, in this time. Um, and the um, the folks we speak to there who are also passionate about a, ch- a regime change in Iran, but have a whole bunch of other concerns and implications to their activism uh, from inside Turkey. Yes, I mean, I wasn't there while you were shooting uh this like footages but by seeing them it's shocking you know i'm i'm surprised at how how i mean there's a huge difference between like the iranian diaspora here exactly yeah there is and and it was a very i mean it was an interesting time to do a documentary uh this this whole period uh folks are very emotional i mean as we've been talking about here in Toronto uh, and and really everywhere in the diaspora, every guest we bring on talks about how they've been sad, they've been crying, they've been elated, they've been emotional, uh, and we really see that in this documentary. Yes, it's yes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of crying. Be ready for that. <laughs> but uh, so the revolution from the backyard, we will release it on our platforms a week from Thursday. Of course, our regular Rook shows continue until then. Let's get to um, some some things that have been happening in the last few days since our our last program before we get to our guests and the big thing I suppose I wanted to lead with this I mean I'll, I'll, I did the essay about the the Western media and the morality police uh, fake news situation I want to get to that but I think really the lead in terms of what we should be talking about in our roundtable is that today was the first of mm-hmm. three days of national strikes in Iran, major strikes happening across Iran as shops and business owners close in solidarity with the Iranian protests and the the burgeoning revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's hard to to get a real handle on how big this is, but certainly watching the videos on social media of all the closed stores and the the eerily quiet uh, Kuchiha, you know, yes. where the uh, was was impressive in terms of the participation rate of these strikes. So, what mm-hmm. do we know, Pega? Well, like you said, it's really difficult to um, kind of pinpoint what kind of effect this has had. But I will say that it's having a big enough impact that um, we're starting to hear from the regime come up with more lies. <laughs> so um, they actually released a statement. I think it was through um, one of the 
one of the members of I can't remember which department, but anyhow, it was it was someone within the with the regime who had said that you know it's actually because um, shopkeepers are afraid of rioters that they're closing <laughs> the stores. You know, they're they're <laughs> being threatened and they're afraid of damage to their um, shops and things like that. So you know, like you said, we could, we don't. So know they exactly. all coordinated to close at the same yeah, time because exactly. they're afraid they're, of they're the fear. Right, right. It all yeah. happened to be at the yes. same time. So, um, you know, we, we don't really know exactly how many stores have closed or what the impact has been economically, but um, certainly the video is coming out of cities like Tehran, Shiraz, Mashhad, Karaj, Tabriz, and I mean, the list goes on. And of course, we're seeing widespread um, shutdowns of businesses in Western Iran, where there's a large Kurdish population as well. So, you know, I mean, um, it's it's been impressive, and I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over the course of the next couple of days especially um, on the 7th. So I think that would be the 16th. Of 16th yeah. 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 So on the 7th, which we talked about previously, is Students' Day. Um, we'll see what happens because there's a very much anticipated rally that's supposed to take place at um, the Azadi Square. Mm. So, I mean, we'll wait and see. And, you know, we've said this a few times on this program, but uh, back to Professor Borgerdi, you yeah. know, two or three months yeah. ago, talking about the, the chips that need to fall for every revolution mm-hmm. to take place. And indeed, what happened in uh, Panjo Haft back mm-hmm. in, you know, yeah. in the Iranian Revolution of 1979, national strikes can play a big oh, role in this. Yes. And so the beginnings of some organized strikes, if you can call this strikes, I guess, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, um is is significant mm-hmm. is significant and and it really shows i mean for for you know i, I seem to be in a battle with uh, i don't know if you guys are finding this but i i in my circles there's still a couple of people kind of going eh, is the revolution yeah. really going to happen i don't know about this well you know how many people are out on the streets and i i sort of make arguments like look um can you imagine Team Melly winning a soccer game at the World Cup mm-hmm. and nobody going out in the streets <laughs> except right. for the Basij and uh, who were flying the flags? Uh, surely that informs you of the support for yeah. uh, the movement right now. But um, this would be another one where it'd be kind of uh, like, well, if this is just about you know a couple thousand disgruntled students, then mm-hmm. you know why are shops closing yeah. on mass in different yeah. cities, right? And I mean, you know, we're, this is a country that's faced so many different. Um, economic issues in the past in the last 40 some odd years you know and we haven't seen nationwide protests nationwide strikes the way that we've been seeing in the last three months so the collective action that's being taken i think is something that you know like you said arguing with people i think that's one of the biggest arguments or at least that's something that i've been saying to a couple of people who i've had that same conversation with is you know where when have we seen this level of you know people being unified together Mm. We, we really haven't so now there has been some has there not been some threat from the regime if you close your store yes. we're going to uh, you know shut you down or do some something to you is Yeah there's there's some reports of um these automated or like generalized text messages that some individuals or shopkeepers and things like that have been receiving and i think it's mostly within the bazaars so um i know there's something similar to unions in terms of structure in bazaars and i think that's where some people are receiving these messages and basically the message is just saying you know um this isn't something that's sanctioned by whatever authority it is that kind of handles these things and um anyone who does close is going to be subject to suspension and fines and perhaps as a segue to that i, I think uh, ali dai is yes. is just so uh, this guy is such a role model mm-hmm. such a so heroic so so the iconic uh, iranian footballer mm-hmm. ali dai mm-hmm. who uh, the most famous footballer we've yes. ever had right yes. and 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 so famous that people around the world know who he is yeah. so famous that he was one of the ambassadors that was there at the at the selection of the world cup mm-hmm. uh, uh what, do you, what do you call it the draw the draw, yeah. the draw he then subsequently boycotted it did not go to the world cup mm-hmm. i'm sure he was invited uh, he mm-hmm. and he's been so outspoken about this regime and he has a couple of shops and yeah. and so he uh, shut them down and, and, and you know made a big statement about doing well, he that he didn't actually shut them down the regime shut down no, but no no, no no he was going to bo- close them for or he did close them for the strikes the strikes yeah, yeah that's sorry. what i mean yeah and and because of that yes. they've now said that's right that's right yeah he 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 closed he, uh, his jewelry, jewelry store think, yeah, yeah. He, and he said just uh, this clo- this um, store is closed for just 3 days and now they shut it down the regime yeah they plump it that's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, I, I mean, it's, um, 
he he i just think this is a guy look i mean we there's so many heroes and and many of them unknown and mm-hmm. unsung and the the people out on the streets you know fighting who are um, workers or kids in some cases the young women who've been leading this thing uh, so you, we don't always want to focus on the superstars but but i just feel like this guy is in such a could choose to live such a life of privilege mm-hmm. you know he's basically he's like Shajarion level, right? In Iran, like he's like an icon, mm. right? Yeah. Um, so he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to do this. I no. mean, you know, he could, he could even give some, some, you know, say a couple, make a couple statements. You know, I support the kids or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. the <clears throat> fact that he's going this far mm-hmm. is so incredibly inspirational yes. to me. You and know? I mean, he's been at the forefront of this. That he was one of the first people to come out against um, FIFA and, and Qatar and the whole World Cup situation. You know, I think he was one of the first people who actually um, said he was going to boycott and not attend. And, you know, I, I actually, I love the way he does it because he does it so politically correct. Um, and the way that he supports the people, it's been constant. There's been no wavering in, in his mm. support for the people. And, and like you said, he's been at the forefront since but day one. By the way, what, what does it mean when they shut down the, when the the state says you're shut down? What does, it, what does that mean? Like, the, you, you mean what happened? Uh, well, I mean, they, how, yeah, what are the mechanics of that? What are they? they okay, they, they close the door and they, like, they put a, a paper in the front of the door that it says, uh, this is store is uh, close f- t- uh, up until who knows you know tell, tell us or not i don't know how can i uh-huh. and they put a, uh, a lock on it yeah yeah uh, a, yeah padlock of some yes, kind yes. what do you call it they, when they shutter it yeah just, they shutter yes. it yeah, yeah. Shutter, it. shutter it yeah well uh i mean good for ali dai and, uh, and or good for iran that they have some yeah. some folks like that and it'll be really you're right to, interesting to see what happens in the ne- mm-hmm. next couple of days with these strikes and also whether these strikes i mean it's been interesting every time it feels like um we're we've sort of the the, the the revolution or the the ongoing movement the uprising has plateaued something new pops up that that right. you know builds it and i and i think for those who are getting impatient or questioning what's going on, mm-hmm. uh, revolutions take time. Exactly. And it's, and it's been three months. It hasn't it's been, been that long. Months. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and uh, something else I wanted to mention about the strikes, actually, and I know we talked about this a um, couple days back or last week, I think it was, when we were talking about the, um, the truck drivers' unions who had um, kind of been at the forefront of leading these these strikes and things like that. Um, what you're saying about the developments, that's exactly what we're seeing. So we're seeing different industries and different people, and they're kind of echoing other sentiments that they've seen previously, and they're doing it in such a smart way because, mm. you know, they're calling for a nationwide strike, allowing time for people to kind of mobilize and, and get together and do this. And I actually saw something really interesting on Telegram where um, I don't know who exactly started this, but there's um, a page or a group created where every single city can actually have kind of like a subsection of this group on Telegram. And so that is the method in which people are trying to communicate with each other to say, you know, for example, the shopkeepers on X street and X city are doing this mm. at this time. So, you know, to see things like that and to see the, the, the unified attempt to do this is incredible. You mentioned the truck drivers union. I got to talk about how uh, a shout out to the Canadian truck yes. drivers. Oh, yeah. This was something that was so fun to see i actually saw this uh it was w- w- one of our friends in in the states i saw it on her social media mm-hmm. it was like kusha or somebody i saw and i and and then i realized like it's, it's down toronto. the street from yeah. me yeah it's in toronto and and i was so i was so heartened and and kind of heart warmed by this uh uh the idea that there was a bunch of canadian truckers who in solidarity with the truckers of Iran mm-hmm. um, drove in a convoy with mm-hmm. with big Iranian I mean Iranian flags meaning Shir Horshid, not yes. the not the Islamic Republic flags but uh, but it was such a, it was so sweet like it, it as much as giant trucks Can driving down the street <laughs> could be sweet but yeah, yeah it was it was a really um, lovely and and kind of poignant uh, show of solidarity mm-hmm. I thought uh, with their worker sisters and brothers on yeah. the other side of the world 
it was definitely surprising. It was one thing I didn't expect and actually didn't even know that we had such a large community of Iranian-Canadian truck drivers. Well, I, well were they just Iranian-Canadians driving I, trucks? I, I don't know. I know that w- um, the gentleman who kind of was spearheading it is an Iranian-Canadian, okay. um, and he put kind of the call to action for anyone. I bet a bunch of those truckers are not Iranian-Canadians. Yeah. I think oh, yeah. they were just solidarity Canadian truckers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good on them. It was really, really nice to see that. Uh, all right, I, I I did the essay about it, but I had to mention before, you know, during this roundtable, oh. this 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 friggin' you know thing that happened, in the, and, and you know, for, for anybody out there who's listening and heard me do uh, the the essay about you know this is a um, PR for the regime and and thinks I'm being melodramatic, I, I was genuinely shocked. Mm-hmm. I mean, for all that I've I've gotten used to the. Um, the quiescence of some of the major players in the Western media, the, that the agenda that some of these... I, I'm not a conspiracy kind of person. I don't believe that all media is, you know, uh, in the pockets of... I mean, I do believe that they're profit-making institutions, but uh, the, and they govern themselves to a certain extent that way. But I, 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 I believe that some of these... These organs have editorial autonomy. I believe that they, there's mm-hmm. some really good journalists who really care, working at a, a, you know, a lot of these media outlets in the West, et cetera, of course. But uh, you see something like this, and of course, uh, I talk about the New York Times, but it, this happened in a, in, a, in a few different mm-hmm. media outlets. And you just go, what's going on here? Like, what's going on? How is it that you've been fucking pretty absent You've been, you know, our biggest, I mean, up until, you know, a month and a half ago, we were like, where's the media? Yeah. Nobody's saying anything. Then there's a couple of sports stories here and there. CNN does two or three things. Mm-hmm. I mean, every time I say something like this, I always get somebody writing to me who sends me like one thing that, you know, <laughs> look what the C- CNN did. And it's yeah. like, well, yeah, I know. There's like, but I mean, compare this to the coverage of other atrocities, other humanitarian dis- disasters, other major events in the world. And tell me, you know, that there's been a lot of coverage here. Mm-hmm. And, and even when the coverage sort of catches up, or, or when there is some, it, it is lagging behind. And so it's this narrative about the morality police. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, women in Iran who are leading this thing, who we're listening to and supporting, uh, seem to be care about a lot more than just the morality police <laughs> yeah. at this point, right? I mean, they want they want a regime change. They want they want universal rights. They want you know so. Uh, then this becomes the lead story and it's not even true it's not even factually accurate you, how can you not think this is conspicuous right yeah i mean there's so many things i mean i was angry on so many different levels when i saw this um you know the first thing is diminishing this revolution that that was the first thing in my mind um and of course i mean obviously you mentioned a lot of this in your essay but um that was explain what you mean by that because i think that's i mean that is what i was trying to say in the in the the essay about the minimizing i mean reducing it to saying that you know and, and i'm just saying this in layman's terms obviously this isn't a summary of the the article or anything like that but essentially that article was saying that oh you know the morality police is being abolished and now everything is going to be great yeah, and, and I mean that's not what well, it wasn't is. quite saying that, but it was saying well, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was basically it seemed like a prescription for lay down your arms now, yeah, everybody. Exactly. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Regime is backing off. It, it's essentially yeah. leading to you know painting a rosy picture once the quote unquote morality police is abolished. Which, first of all, that's definitely not the case. Let, let's just run with this for a second. Even if there was an actual abolishment of the morality police. Mm. That's not going to turn you on into rainbows and butterflies. I no. mean, there, there's there's a million and one things that people. First of all, the, the morality police are not the hijab law. Let's yeah. be clear about that too. That's right. You can you can abolish the morality police and and the, the, those dress code laws are still going to exist. That's right. Uh, they'll just be enforced in a different way. Um, I should mention that uh, our first guest coming up, Erica Lebon, she one of the things she's been talking about is facial recognition technology, mm-hmm. which which undermines the or like you know. Um, causes the morality police to certain to a certain extent to be redundant because now they get these sort of digital mm-hmm. you know uh, face re- facial recognition um, cameras of these these any, anybody who's contravening these yeah. stupid laws and they go to their houses and arrest That's them. That's right. Well, know. remember we talked about that with the incident in the subway station because I was saying that they had installed those cameras right. in subway stations right. and things like that. Um, but actually going back to what you were saying about the jurisdiction and, and, and this not being something that 
just with the disappearance of the morality police is going to fix anything. It's funny because the individual who actually made this comment about the morality police being abolished is an attorney general. And he has zero jurisdiction on this matter. So um, even even in terms of where this source of information came yeah. from is is completely, you know, wrong mm-hmm. or, or fake news for rac- for lack of a better term. So, you know, like I was saying, I was really angry with the idea of diminishing this revolution. Yeah. Then I was angry about, you know, the lack of ethics in terms of journalism. I mean, the individuals who have written this article now, I definitely have thoughts on, uh, you know, the authors, but uh, just in terms of not doing their due diligence. And yet we have that whole fiasco a couple of weeks ago where there was all this controversy about the headline about the 15,000 people right. being executed. Right. Well, where is that same, you right. know, um, kind of charge where is, where for... Is that, where is the intramedia backlash to exactly. say, hey, keep a check on this stuff, you That's guys. Right. This isn't true. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, most importantly... This is completely wrong. I mean, it, it's just, it boggles my mind that, mm. you know, something like this is now circulating and getting the attention of, you know, everyone, mm. and yet it's incorrect. Uh, mistakes happen, misinterpretations happen. How do you turn that into a major headline, major headline, mm-hmm. major story to lead off your, you know, that's, the, that's what makes it conspicuous, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what makes it eerie it's mm-hmm. like come on this is your and and in the context of 11 weeks of not you know as i said in the essay you got you got to here let me give you a hundred options on what your headlines mm-hmm. could be because there's certainly headlines coming out of iran yeah you know what, how about a headline about kids being murdered how about a headline about famous uh intellectuals and actors and artists being and arrested every choose. day and this is what you choose that's not even factually correct. That's right. You know, that's a, that's a skewer, a skewing of, of something to kind of peddle a, a headline. That And I think one of the reasons we get upset about this, and I saw some friends last night, and everybody was upset about mm-hmm. it. I mean, everybody, is not, it's not about the Iranian community because the Iranian community to the large, to a large exactly. extent, is informed. Yes. The Iranian community that cares anyway mm-hmm. uh, in the in the diaspora is consuming a lot, knows yeah. what's going on. It's about the delta between the Iranian community and the rest of the world mm-hmm. that is getting dribs and drabs of information, isn't on Persian Twitter, you know, isn't following yeah. this 24-7, and depends on media outlets like this, and then goes, oh, I guess that thing's over, you yeah. know? Yeah, I, I guess mean, the regime is like, you know, they reformed and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And, and and I mean, it's it's that's the infuriating part. Yeah, I mean, yesterday morning I was woke up and I just checked my phone and I, I have a Canadian friend who lives in Vancouver she sent me a text that just read the news hopes hope it's true and lasting and i was sure i was sure <laughs> the revolution right. happened and i i yeah and i couldn't find anything that says right, revolution right. happened yeah. and i asked her which news and so she sent this news and i was like oh no yeah. this is the war that's exact that's a, that yeah. is exactly the problem yeah. that is exactly the problem it's interpreted by someone who isn't following it really closely to go oh okay so they, you know, yeah. a bunch of people did some, yeah. you know, some, there were some women who, they were brave and they did some yeah, protesting and now it's over <laughs> yeah. and they yeah. backed off and everything's fine, you know. And oh yeah, it's going to be difficult for a while. Obviously they have to negotiate <laughs> with this regime. It, 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 there's not a lot of options for why you would run this thing. That's exactly what there I was There really say, aren't. Yeah. The only, the, it keeps coming back to the same thing for me. I'll put it to our guests today. But I mean, it. it's, it's, it's a softening, it's the softening up the image of the regime mm-hmm. somehow yes. to create the conditions where, you know, there could be some dealing with. Uh, exactly. And, and so it comes from a, a standpoint of, I mean, forgive the, 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 there just isn't another word for it from a reformist kind of standpoint mm-hmm. of like, let's see if we can kind of, you know, get past this period, which really at this point is a prescription for status quo. It means you want the regime to stay. Maybe you even have some interest in the yes. regime staying, and but you know that there's been some issues, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief because the morality, the morality police. police are going to be disbanded. Yeah. I mean, who, you know, I, I did that little video last night, and I, I, I you'd be hard pressed to find an Iranian 
who would be like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, I'm okay, so happy. great. It's over. You know, I mean, come on. So, who are these people consulting, right? Wh- who are they? Where Where is this coming from? Like, wh- what's the What's the again? What is the, the agenda? agenda? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I was gonna say it's funny because if you look back at I don't know, ten weeks ago, eleven weeks ago, nine weeks ago, whatever it was, we were calling for the media. We were saying, you know, where is the West sure. media? Where are they? That yeah. sort of thing. And we were hoping that with through channels like newspapers and and tv stations and news and whatever we could kind of spread the message mm-hmm. of what is happening and now we're seeing that not only are we not able to spread the message we're, we're having to fight yeah. now to clarify what is actually happening and, you know i'm just somebody I'm, I'm generally interested in media i generally you know i'm a, a subscriber to the new york mm-hmm. times so i happen to see what and i'm always especially in the last you know three months i've been looking been seeing well when is there yeah. what are they writing about iran about and iran. honestly on most days there's nothing mm-hmm. there's nothing not even you know lead stories there's nothing yeah. at all about iran they, they you know there's been a couple of, they've done a two or three good things they did the, the massacre in zahidan they did a couple of things uh but it, it's it's so bizarre that in the context of nothing mm-hmm. this is your like you're not going to do a, a major story about executions you're going to do right. this right and you're right when the when the perception was that the media had got it wrong in the other direction Mm -hmm. that presumably we were too hard on the regime because there was this information about 15,000 people being executed which kind of actually is true I mean ultimately it's you know anyone and everyone can be on death row but but there were some nuances to that that made it yes factually problematic when that was the case you know NBC or whatever was they, they were right. they were they were doing whole pieces on this this is the problem with fake, fake news. news you have yeah, to be exactly. careful where is that now yeah where is that now where's the where's the official edict i mean even the the state media in Iran has denied this thing about the yeah. morality <laughs> police, right? Well, they haven't denied it, but they haven't um, confirmed it either. And I think part of the reason is because the individual who, like I said, made this statement was an attorney general who has absolutely zero jurisdiction to actually make a statement like this. And I think there's, um, I don't know what his um, diplomatic post is technically, but he's there's a gentleman who's in, um, in Sweden, if I'm not mistaken mm-hmm. right now, on some sort of diplomatic um, venture or something like that. And he's heavily tied to the IRGC and things mm-hmm. like that. And there's all these um, concerns about why he's there and all that. But um, a, new, um, a journalist actually asked him, can you comment on this? And he very quickly sidestepped the question because I think part of the, the concern from the regime side is now they don't know how to address this mm-hmm. because the individual who's made this statement is someone who had absolutely no right to make the statement. Mm-hmm. And now there's all of this well, controversy look, surrounding it. If it were it. true, it would be you know, we'd be having a, a just as heated a discussion, but mm-hmm. it would be this is a PR stunt. That's right. Why are you making it a headline? Be careful. The regime is throwing this out there as a as a as bait. It's not mm-hmm. really so what the morality police, that's not what this is about. People want a revolution. But it wasn't even it true. Wasn't even true. <laughs> yeah. That's the I mean that's the that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's, I mean, what do you uh, and, and you know and like when you lost your trust right now i'm thinking that why they did cover the zahedan massacre ma- ma- yeah yeah and why regime would benefit from the covering of yeah. that news i mean <laughs> it starts a question everything, starts a question yeah. everything. Yeah. well why 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 not yeah, yeah. it's it's a uh, uh and look they can't we can't expect the western media to, to do Iran 24-7. Yeah. That's, that's not fair. Yeah. It's not realistic. It's a big world. There's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot of atrocities even taking place around yeah. the world. But this is too weird. It is. It's, and it's too, you know, there's been a, I, I, last week I did that essay going, um, do you, what did I call it? I said, do you, do you want more than lip, lip service? service? What I was, yeah. where I was actually going with that was, are you waiting, or is the West waiting for the revolution to fail? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what I feel like when I see these yeah. kind of articles. That's I go, exactly it. I go. They're basically, you know, they don't really want the, 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 for whatever reasons, and we know there's a lot of agendas for a lot of nations out there. They they would prefer mm-hmm. this regime. They know it's not a good regime, but let's you know, <laughs> the only people who are really going to suffer are those are Iranians. People. So let's keep them in power. You know, or let's have them there yeah. as the threat of a bad example, mm-hmm. or yeah. as an enemy we can speak about, or whatever it is. Uh, and yeah, or 
were there there are people as we know in the west who benefit from mm-hmm. this regime who are tied to it and who have the resources to yes. affect policy or you know uh, conversations yeah i mean the unfortunate reality is i think a lot a lot of people gain to benefit from this regime staying in power and i think that i mean again i'm not one for conspiracies either but it's hard not to give into some of those theories mm. when you see you know articles like this and and lack of attention from international shadow banning and all yeah, yeah i mean yeah. all Meta. of that, everything yeah, yeah. everything is, that we've talked y- about yeah, the yeah. last 11 uh, y- weeks there's a good there's an easy case to be made exactly. that meta has a has a financial has a has a better case uh uh by the books in terms of making money to keep iran in power mm-hmm. than it does that yeah. this regime i mean than not yeah, yeah. One more thing about the media, um, especially in terms of, you know, reporting on Iran and things like that. When that whole 15,000 execution headline came out, I actually got into an argument with some friends because they were really angry and they were saying, you know, this is bullshit and, and why are they doing this and covering the fact that it's quote unquote fake news. And I was saying, I was actually standing up on, on some level for, um, you know, the journalism, mm. the whole ethical journalism concept and, and not reporting fake news and things like that. And I think that's part of why I'm so angry this time, because, you know, when that happened, I was saying, well, I understand, you know, it wasn't necessarily a fact. Maybe the headline was, you know, misleading or this and that. But it's the exact same thing here. And and we don't see that same level of, of anger mm-hmm. or anything like that. And and I think part of the problem is that there's so many nuances to reporting on Iran mm-hmm. and actually getting it right. And if you're not an Iranian and you don't know the history and the background mm-hmm. and kind of these, these cultural bits and pieces like mm-hmm. we do and the people within our network, it's sometimes hard to report on it. But this doesn't require any of that. This is this is straight I fact. mean, so to put it another way, there you'd be pretty hard pressed, even if you were looking to, to find something positive to say about this regime in the last eleven mm-hmm. weeks. And this would be the something that you could say. You like if you were if you were prone to wanting to both sides this and to go, well, what? Yeah. Well, look at the, re-, you know, you'd go, oh, well, they're you know they're backing off the morality police thing, which they weren't. But you take that and you make that your your big article, your big headline, and your top of the fold story. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. Um, okay, thanks, guys. We I think we probably you know people are like okay we we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do angry. another essay about this now. Yeah. Um, thank you. I should say we're uh, coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there rookmedia.com that you can link to all of our platforms so we here are, are on our ongoing mission to build a new audio visual encyclopedia of iranian diaspora identity and you can find us on spotify soundcloud apple podcasts instagram Castbox. if you like to see some visuals with rook you can always watch us on youtube and if you like your rook descriptions and bulletins in english and in persian check us out on telegram you can subscribe on any of those platforms and you can support us uh, by going to the support us button at rookmedia.com. We really appreciate the support. We depend on that. Uh, so for five bucks a month or something, you can be a patron and uh, that helps us out. Um, thank you, Pega. Thank you. Thank you, Shia. Uh, let us get to our first guest. We're going to go to California. My first guest is an Iranian British criminal defense attorney based in the United States. Elika Lebong was born and raised in London in an Iranian family. She obtained her master's degree in criminal justice. Her specialty is criminal justice at the intersection of systemic racism. Beyond her day job, of course, she's been very active and outspoken since the uprising in Iran began in September and has had millions of views of her content in giving context to what is happening there and amplifying voices is from inside Iran and right now. Elika Lebon joins me from California today. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you're a, a busy lawyer. Um, and then about three months ago, at least to judge from your social media, which I know is never the, the, the paragon of accuracy, but it seems like you jumped into um, this in a big way and you've been incredibly active. What has that been like for you the last two and a half months? Well, um, I had actually started building my social media platform just really um, not long before that. So um, I started using TikTok just like three or four months ago. And I started building my platform platform just talking about social justice 
justice issues, to be honest. And um, it kind of just rapidly expanded overnight, literally overnight. It was really weird. And then um, not long ago, September, obviously, the Iranian revolution um, began fermenting. And it was just kind of like a weird twist of fate that I had already started building this platform right before. And so I'd kind of generated a little bit of attention doing that. And I was able to just kind of slip right into um, the revolution and, and get eyes on everything because people had already been paying attention to my videos because of what I was talking about before. I think it helps that you're a lawyer, um, especially Iranians like p professionals, doctors, lawyers. We there's a there's a respect and there's sort of a, a deference that um, the community shows. Does it does it feel like? And I'm going to get into some issues with you in terms of what's happening in Iran. But just just to hear a bit more about your personal journey, does it? At this point, I mean, does it become self-perpetuating in the sense that you now feel like you have a responsibility if you're not posting every other day or, or daily because you've been so outspoken? Yeah, it absolutely does. And I think, um, you know, the more that I'm outspoken and the more that, you know, I'm speaking either through social media or through the media or through podcasts or whatever, um, I get a lot of messages from people asking me to be the voice of this person and that person. And it's just a constant barrage of messages I need. And, you know, it's not something I can ignore. It's not something I can be like, no, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be his voice. Of course, I have to be their voice. And so it's tough because you have to manage um, all of these competing things in my life right now, which is that I actually have a job, I have to work. And then at the same time, I need to uh, you know, it's my responsibility to be an activist for the uh, revolution in Iran because I they, I know that they're relying on me to be their voice. And then at the same time, I have the messages that are like, can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? And then at the same time, I have to go out there and, you know, do all the talking. So it, it's it's a lot to manage. It's interesting. I mean, I certainly identify with someone who's grown up in the diaspora but feels this this profound connection, this umbilical cord to Iran. Um, do, do you have people saying, well, why why are you so passionate about this? You didn't even grow up in Iran? Um, no, <laughs> nobody says that to me. I think it's kind of well understood because, you know, it's an experience that my family went through. It's an experience that my parents through, went through, you know, uh, my family, my mom, my aunt were in Evin prison. My uncle was executed, 13 of my family members were executed. And I think that was actually kind of the precursor to how I have this kind of sense of justice just kind of epigenetically transferred into my being, right? And it's like my intense passion for criminal justice that the the backdrop for that is my family's history. So um, you know, this isn't like I woke up one day and I started suddenly being passionate about something. Right. I've been passionate my whole life. And the reason that I have so much passion is because <laughs> the Islamic Republic put it in my veins, you yeah. know? Yeah. And by the way, even if you don't have all that experience with criminal justice, um, my experience doing this program and talking to people in the diaspora is that connection that uh, people of Iranian descent feel with Iran and being Iranian um, doesn't fade. It's in the DNA. And you're seeing it, the, the power of the diaspora right now, speaking out even the second and third and fourth generation Iranians. Um, let me ask you about what's going on, and because you've been posting about it, and and uh, I, I want to get your perspective, which is is a, is a really interesting one. First of all, in terms of the last twenty four forty eight hours, we just talked about it on our on our roundtable here. Um, this this news that came out, quote unquote news, if I can put it in. Um, inverted brackets that the about the morality police in Iran being disbanded um, I've posted about this you posted about this a, a lot of people have uh, called this everything from fake news to a particular agenda let me get your thoughts on this why did some major players in the Western mainstream media run with a story about the morality police in Iran being disbanded yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because I've been having this conversation with my friends who are part of the diaspora as well for a while where we were talking about it's interesting that, you know, the Islamic Republic is not getting smart because if you were smart, you'd pull a stunt like this, right? And then all of a sudden we hear the news that they've consulted with Russia, you know, about how to quell these uprisings, what's the best move, like how do we engage in these cyber wars? And we know that the Islamic Republic has a history of deep engagement with cyber war, right? And 
you know, not long after, a day or two later, there's this news that the morality police has been disbanded. And I think the reason that that's so, that was kind of a, a, a clever stunt on their behalf is that they uh, are relying or they are um, exploiting the fact that the Western media know so little about Iran. And, you know, this word morality police, it's like this is this is the word that the Western media picks up on and they, they speak about all the time because this was kind of the origins of the revolution. When we talk about the death of Masajina Amini, it was at the hands of the morality police, right, which is a branch of Farajah law enforcement. But the revolution that has taken place since then has nothing to do with the morality police. We're talking about IRGC. We're talking about Basij, which is a, a branch of IRGC. We're talking about a completely different movement now that is against the Velayat al-Fati, the guardian of the Islamic jurist. And so they are, the regime is relying on the fact that the only, the only word the western media understands is morality police so they're like okay yeah no more morality police and the western media is like oh this means the revolution is over not understanding that this has nothing to do with the revolution number one and number two they haven't disbanded they've just rebranded um but uh, okay I'm, I'm well said uh, but is it is it as simple as that? I mean, is this an act of omission, like they just don't know better, or is it an act of commission? Like, it's really weird to me that the New York Times hasn't written that much about Iran, that they've written a couple of things that, of course, famously or infamously, many of us have pointed to and gone, this is, you know, where did this come from? This is bullshit information. Um, they did one thing on Zahedan, which I thought was good, the massacre of Zahedan, but, but otherwise pretty much absent. And then yesterday, I mean, it wasn't just that they ran with this story. It was at the top of the fold. It was like the, the story on the website. And that, to me, feels too conspicuous. Like, it doesn't feel like, oh, they don't know better and they just think this is about morality police and so the, the regime is backing off, which, of course, if they just scratch beneath the surface, any Iranian would tell you that's bullshit. But mm. it was the placement of it. What, what do you make of that? So one thing that, I or we in the diaspora have noticed is that there is a group of hard left wing communists, which are referred to pejoratively as tankies. And tankies are very pro regime. And they parrot the regime propaganda that has been spreading for the past 43 years, which is that none of this is true. It's just a lie made up by the USA and Israel. Okay, so in order to um, proliferate that lie, one of the tactics that these uh, extreme minority left wing groups do is that they paint any attention um, on what's going on in Iran as Islamophobia. Mm. And they paint it as, you know, trying to paint these mullahs in the most negative light possible which reveals your implicit bias against Muslims. You, you, you hate Middle Easterners, you hate Muslims. And so this, of course, instills fear. And, and this is one of the things that when that, um, you know, the news came out about the fake news about the 15,000 protesters, this is what all of these like hard left liberals, I don't even like to call them liberals because I like to refer to myself that way. And this is not that. Mm -hmm their immediate, all of their posts were like, this is fake news, this is Islamophobia, you just want to paint Iran in this bad light. And it's like, this is not Iran, this is the Islamic Republic, and they are not even Islamic, they are a terrorist regime. Mm. So I think that this propaganda has kind of, you know, inspired this idea that if you speak negatively about the Islamic Republic of Iran, you must be Islamophobic, you must hate brown people. Mm. And so you know, they they are kind of taking this opportunity to be like, look, look how sympathetic we are to people of color. Look how sympathetic we are to, you know, regimes and um, frameworks of governance that are different to us. You know, maybe we just need to understand them. It's just bullshit. Sorry. But uh, well, it's OK. I mean, you could use that word. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I also think, I mean, let me try this out on you. If, if I were someone who believed, let's say I was quote unquote soft on the regime, I thought, ah, maybe it's not so bad, this, this this regime. And I'm sitting in the West and I've even had some dealings with them or something. I'm not talking about me. I'm saying hypothetically. And, and I think that reform is the way forward in Iran. And uh, wouldn't it be convenient for, wouldn't this story really play into that kind of a philosophy that, look, yeah. 
the regime, there were some protests and people got upset. The regime is backing down and now we can do business with them and maybe even restart the nuclear deal. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly what the purpose of this whole thing is. It's it's regime sympathizing um, in order to cultivate this narrative of reform, which is which we've been very clear about, which is not what we want. Um, but yeah, re- reform allows them to um, maintain the status quo, re-engage, re-engage with the nuclear deal. But I mean, honestly, none of that makes sense for the West anyway. Yeah. It doesn't make sense for the West to to negotiate with the regime you know it none of it really makes a lot of sense um and so even you know these ideas about you know they just want to sympathize with the regime in order to engage with this deal and do this and that n- none of that even makes sense for them anyway it just it, the whole thing doesn't make sense um what one of the well there, there there are some that benefit from the regime staying in power so in that sense it might make sense but um the so, something that you've talked about is just in terms of the the fake news element of this morality police uh issue is that even if they're not even if gash Ershad is not out in the streets picking up people as um consistently or as conspicuously um that they're doing it in a more devious way at this point with something called the the use of a fa- facial recognition technology. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we don't know too much about this. This is the news that's come out of Iran, which is why it also makes it difficult because, you know, the news doesn't <laughs> consult with anything that comes out of Iran. They just use a Western mouthpiece. But um, from what we understand, instead of patrolling, because it, same here in the States as ev- everywhere else, you have patrol officers, you have surveillance officers, you have intelligence, like there are many branches to law enforcement. And so uh, the morality Gash de Ershad was previously um, a patrol unit, right? So you're walking around the streets, you're seeing who doesn't have hijab, whose hijab is incorrectly being worn. And you detain them just as they, as they did with Masa Gina Amini, and then you investigate and you educate, which often leads to violence. And so instead of patrolling now, they're using surveillance in this type of dystopian big brother um way in order to be able to catch women directly just walking around and their hijabs are incorrectly, you know, worn. And that way that I mean it's so much more um it's it's so much more clandestine it's so much more alarming because you're not having people videoing women in the street being targeted by the morality police you're having them show up at your home in the middle of the night and nobody knows what happens to you nobody knows that you've disappeared nobody knows that they've taken you to the station and what happened to you and so this news is not going to be reported in the same way so by by transitioning from patrol to surveillance they actually did something that was significantly worse but at the same time they were able to um create this pretext of reform to the world right right and of course the next step once they detain people is um as we've heard these executions and the executions take place after a a trial uh, once again in quotation marks and i want to get your perspective as a criminal defense attorney uh, I, I noticed that your name on Instagram is Tumaj Salahi, who, of course, is pretty much on death row uh, now. Um, w- what is it? W- what are we to make of these these trials that take place in Iran? And what is it like to be sitting there as a, a lawyer watching that go down? Well, first of all, um, one thing that's <laughs> one thing that's so infuriating as a lawyer is the is noticing the fact that I mean, people who people here in the USA don't even understand USA law, okay? They don't even understand American law. And through their lack of understanding of American law, they're trying to understand (laughs) Iranian law. So it's like double layer of ignorance, right? So, um, but, you know, just to explain the way that the death penalty process works here in the US, you're obviously arrested and you're tried, but the trial is bifurcated, right? So there's a bifurcated trial, there's a guilt phase and a penalty phase. At the guilt phase, a jury of your 12 of your peers determine whether you're guilty or not guilty. And then you go to the penalty phase where either, depending on what state you're in, you have uh, another um, set of jury determine whether you're eligible for, whether 
you you're issued the death penalty or one judge or three judges so it varies by state right so there's a democratic process to ensure every step of the way i mean and even then people are sentenced to death when they're actually innocent and um so that's one thing that they don't understand that in the islamic republic none of that exists first of all you you are tortured into a false confession and then at trial that false confession is used against you in a situation where you have no lawyer you have no right to a defense attorney the prosecutor plays the same role as the judge and the judge without any fleshing out any evidence in front of a jury or uh you know oftentimes inventing charges against you that are not true because they've tortured you into confessing to it then issues the death sentence and another thing that's so important to understand is that um you know they made the media went on and on and on about how these 15,000 protesters being executed was fake news because they said the parliament you know urged the judiciary to do so but the parliament has no um power mm. to enforce death sentences and this again is another misunderstanding for two reasons number one because in these situations of executing mass protesters it is not even the judiciary judiciary who makes that decision it is vali afaqi who is the supreme leader because because the, the supreme leader, the Islamic jurist, sits above the state. So the, the West doesn't understand that there's anything above the state, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And second of all, the parliament, which is the Islamic Consulative Assembly, uh, which is the equivalent to the legislature here in the US, has a very different power than the legislature does here in the US. Here in the US, the legislature cannot mandate the death sentence through legislature, right? that is unconstitutional but in the islamic republic the is the assembly can mandate the death sentence through legislation so it is very possible and this is exactly what they're talking about doing now it is very they are talking about the assembly creating legislation which mandates the death penalty for anybody who is found talking to the media so not understanding this from the Western perspective and, and looking at the Middle East through this Western construct makes it so that the lives of Iranians are in such danger. It's so alarming, but it's constantly being pacified and underplayed here in the West because they don't understand the legal framework in the Islamic Republic. Well, and uh, if you'll forgive the naivete of, of, of a, a question like this, but I'm assuming that um, no defense counsel allowed, no real trial, forced confessions. Uh, all of that is in circumvention of international laws around this stuff, I would assume, right? Yes, absolutely. Which also means nothing to a certain extent. I mean, uh, this is a, perhaps a segue to, to ask you why you think, I mean, I did an essay last week about how why doesn't the West why isn't the West doing more than lip service and I we've gotten to the point where Western leaders are saying things now Biden and Macron and Trudeau you know but in terms of actual action there was the UN special session um, but it seems like pathetically little is going on in terms of um, in, in the midst of, of an humanitarian crisis. You know, this is not a, a civil war. This is a one way sort of uh, attack on the people of Iran. Uh, why do you think that is? Why isn't why isn't the West? Why aren't the Western powers doing more? I think that the Western powers. Kind of create this veil of competence that may not actually exist in the sense that I don't think that they can do as much as people think that they can do. You know, okay, yeah, we had the UN special session and the Islamic Republic has outright come, and, come out and said, we're not gonna comply with it, we don't care. What is the UN gonna do? Are you gonna go to war? No. So, you know, the lip service is lip service because there's nothing to substantiate it. And this is a situation where typically you have um, countries that are and in a, at, in the global perspective, they are kind of subjugated because of the leverage that other um, countries, other nations have over that, right? So it's like, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. But now we have a situation where the Islamic Republic is not as isolated as people think it is. 
The Islamic Republic has Russia, the mm. Islamic Republic has China, the Re Islamic Republic has superpowers and other countries that are more than willing to lend a hand and keep their economy um, alive. So all of these threats that are being made from the West kind of mean nothing to the Islamic Republic. Well, I would push back on that, though, and say that the West isn't as impotent as all that. You you often, you've used the example of George Floyd, for example, um, uh, when it comes to Massa Amini as being the symbolic person who represents uh, an injustice that's occurred many times before. But the George Floyd thing, I mean, it did lead to a global discussion around Black Lives Matter. Um, the Ukraine situation has led to material support, uh, military support for the people of Ukraine. Why, why is Iran different from those? You're talking about a situation where, you know, again, it's com it's comparing a completely different framework in the West where we have a democratic framework. The reason why this is why we say Iran will never be free until there is a democracy, because with democracy comes accountability. If you are in under a democracy and you do not comply with the needs and demands of your constituents, you will be voted out at the next cycle, right? So in order to maintain your power in a democracy, you must appease the public. In a despotic authoritarian dictatorship, it doesn't matter whether you appease the public or not. You stay in power and if people disagree with you, you slaughter them, right? So there's a very different incentives even with the George Floyd thing, do do we believe that people actually cared when they instigated these changes? Of course, they don't care. I mean, we care, but we can't. It's it's naive to believe that the powers actually cared, but they knew that they would be elected out, and that was their incentive. And so, this is why we say democracy is the only way to for Iran to have freedom because mm. that accountability. Mm forces the people in power to listen. But millions of dollars were put into, whether it's by governments or even big corporations, were put into the Black Lives Matter, right, rightly so in, in, in many cases. Um, that, that kind of money could help the, the kids who are currently throwing stones at um, uh, militia in Iran, right? How, how do we get that money into Iran? There's, we, we have statutes that prohibit, um, you know, tran transferring any finances to um Iran to any financial institution there's I mean it's blocked right and even any money that we were to transfer to Iran again no democracy no accountability no responsibility for that money this is a regime that embezzles the money of the people and they have no reason not to because who's going to hold them accountable what about the the idea of those um um, those 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 devices that can help unblock the internet for example that's it would would the pushback on that be well we have to smuggle them in somehow how do we do that this see this is this is a really difficult one i mean i think ideally it would be fantastic if we could get funds into you know a, a development of vpns to help people um access the internet but the question is who who is the person responsible for that and if their identity is known they're executed so in in theory I mean, I, I would love this idea that we can kind of um, create, you know, generate funds mm. to put towards that. It's just a significantly harder in practice. Yeah, I guess the I guess the um, at the end it comes down to uh, in terms of what the West can do and and not be impotent about uh, with all that you've said, which uh, those are those are fine points. Um, it comes down to what's that slogan, you know, we're not asking you to save us, just stop saving the murderers, you know, stop enabling yeah. the regime. Right. And and we see that in various ways. And one of the ways is, is this company Meta, you know, Facebook and Instagram. Um, uh, t tell me what you've learned in terms of what Meta does. We've talked about this on this program um, in, in suppressing content that has to do with Iran and social media. Yes, yeah, so um, it, we had all noticed, not only as the diaspora, but our allies, that any content that we were sharing about Iran, it would kind of mysteriously disappear. Our accounts would become shadow banned. You know, we'd be talking about other, um, we'd had, have t spoken about other things in the past that would get, you know, tons of views. And then suddenly you're speaking about Iran and everything becomes suppressed. And then um, something came out uh, in uh, BBC earlier this year in May, where there were a couple of whistleblowers 
um, from Telus, which is a company that Meta outsources to for moderation. Tell us. And they, yeah. tell us, Telus, I don't know what you want to call it. And they came forward and said that um, they had been offered money to remove posts on Iran. Um, and obviously, you know, when you hear stuff like this, you'd, you, you of course know that this is not one or two people in one or two scenarios. Like this is something that is happening at the mass level. And then especially when you think of companies like TikTok, which is owned by China and China has every incentive to, you know, they have no reason not to accept those funds. Why wouldn't they accept those mm. funds? And we know that the Islamic Republic has this history of cyber war. And this is one of the their, their key safeguards to saying in power is winning the cyber war, right? And we know that they put money behind that. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that any of us are really that surprised that this is what's going on. Hmm. Alec, before I let you go, I mean, it's it's so great talking to you. you it's it's uh, um, it's an education. Um, one of the things that you've been outspoken about is uh, those of us in the diaspora being active. Um, uh, I'm obviously on side with that, but there, because of what we're doing with our programming and uh, 24/7. But, but there are folks who sort of say, "Well, what, what does it make a difference what we do?" Um, and of course, we all agree that it's self determination for the people inside Iran. Um, why do you think a big part of the equation of this revolution is people in the diaspora being engaged and active? Yeah, so I mean, I have said this ad, ad nauseum at this point, but you know, we have observed this trend in the past where um, people who are at risk of execution or have indeed been um, issued the death sentence, when they get international attention, when we make them famous in the international community, this um, dissuades the regime from executing them because they do not want to remobilize these uprisings that they're already struggling to deal with in Iran, inside of Iran right now, okay? So their goal is to assuage, not to ignite. So when we make these people famous by saying their names, by talking about them, by making videos about them, um, by sharing them, by having our allies share them, uh, they become notable people and the regime doesn't execute notable people. It hasn't yet. And it, even in a leaked audio that came out recently, um, apparently, because we can't confirm the validity, um, some uh, an official of the regime was overheard saying that um, they didn't want um, Hossein Ronagi, the uh, human rights activist in Iran, to die in right. custody right before the World Cup because it right. would ignite another series of protests. Right. So we have a very we have veritable proof that this actually works. So the diaspora and our allies are sometimes, you know, they're a little bit um, uh, pessimistic in thinking that, oh, I, I don't think that anything that I could do could possibly help, but they don't understand that when you talk about them, when you comment, when you get engaged, you're like, you're boosting the algorithm. Mm. You are helping. It's like voting, right? One person voting does nothing, but when we all vote, it does everything. Mm. So everybody in the diaspora being united in talking about these people, these high risk pe people, it really actually saves their lives. A final question to you, and I'm um, speaking of uh, repeating things ad nauseum. I feel like I've been asking this question over and over again for 11 weeks or, or whatever it's been, but but I think it's an important one or a relative one in terms of the, especially the people who are um, spending a lot of time uh, like you are being active around this. How how are you um, <laughs> are you feeling? How are you how are you um, processing what's happening in Iran right now are you are you hopeful um, there are those of us that toggle back and forth between being incredibly heartbroken and depressed at um, seeing more executions or arrests or or bloodshed etc and, and and then the exhilaration of seeing action being taken and and those brave young women and 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 girls and, and men and boys in the streets and and the strikes that began uh, today for three three days. Uh, where where are you at are you are you feeling hopeful yeah you know at the beginning of the revolution it was um emotionally very very complicated and difficult for me to deal with i my mental health was not good um and i could feel it deteriorating and i took a short break i took a trip and i kind of closed off for a bit and i came back and i you know learned how to um navigate this uh without so much emotional attachment because that's what was wearing me out 
Um, but at this point, I would say that I have no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind that we are going to win the revolution. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you how, or I can't tell you why, but I do know with every fiber in my being that in this lifetime, we will see a free Iran. There's no stopping. It's too late. It's too late to stop us now. As Masi Ali Najad said, because her life has obviously been at risk, she said, you can kill me, but you can't kill the idea. Mm. There's no stopping the idea now. The idea of freedom, that's just going to keep proliferating until it's ours. Alika, I really, I know how busy you are. Uh, well, I don't even know how busy you are. I can only assume how busy you are with your job and with uh, all the requests to speak to different um, um, channels and all of that. Thank you so much for taking uh, so much time with us and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Thank you. The breath of the morning I keep forgetting The smell of the warm summer air I live in a town Where you can't smell a thing You watch your feet For cracks in the past this is Rook, episode 221, The Uprising. Western media are doing PR for the regime. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Let us go to New York now. And our next guest, Nicole Ansari Cox. She's an Iranian, German, American actor, director, producer, writer, and yoga therapist. She is the founder of Actors Rising, a program for artists merging the spiritual path with their arts. Her professional life began in her teens as an actor in an iconic German TV series. She has starred since then in numerous projects and has co-produced two feature films, Blumenthal, starring her husband, Brian Cox, and the thriller As Good As Dead with Andy McDowell. Recently, Nicole has been very outspoken about the situation in Iran and particularly in solidarity with women on the front lines there. A couple of weeks ago, she attended the Emmy Awards with Woman Life Free Freedom printed prominently on her skin below her neck. And right now, Nicole Ansari Cox joins me from New York. Hello. Hello. So nice to meet you. Thank you for coming on the program. It's uh, it's nice to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I've been uh, listening and watching your interviews, and I find them uh, very enriching in this time. It's very kind of you. A couple of days ago, Nicole, you wrote on social media, what's happening in Iran is heartbreaking and shocking and at the same time exciting because for the first time in my lifetime, this is you speaking, it feels like this revolution is here until the country is free. Tell me about that feeling, that excitement that you are feeling and and the the collision and collusion of the different feelings that exist at this time. Yeah, so... Um uh, I, I grew up mostly in Germany and then, you know, all over Europe and, and, and also the United States. So um, I have been in the diaspora and I visited Iran when I was a child with my family once before the revolution. And um, I always wanted to go back because I loved Iran and I loved the Persian food, Persian music, Persian bastani, ice cream, everything Persian, and uh, dancing. I mean, uh, just love um, uh, dancing. I have something in my eye here. And um, my dad was so, um, I think, dismayed about what happened to his country. He um, uh, cut everything off except his close family and friends. Mm but never wanted my sister and me to um, to be part of it because it was so heartbreaking. And um, uh, I grew up with the sense that Iran is this autocracy, this awful place that, that suppresses women, suppresses human rights, and um, is just not a good place to ever want to go back to. Um, uh, don't even learn the language only you know my my dad actually legally changed his name mm. 
to not have the Allah at the end of his name, mm. uh, Nasrat Allah, um, and change it to a Jew Jewish name, uh, Noah, although we are not Jewish. Um, but it was a point he was making. So I grew up with Iran as this horror show, like everybody else in the West had yeah. of Iran. But then, of course, I had my, my family and close friends um, in the diaspora, you know, celebrating and singing Iran, Iran. And, mm. you know, so I had this sense that there is a part of me that never um, was able to live and be acknowledged fully. And um, the idea that we could finally have a free Iran um, just very ego egotistically for myself, um, I want to have that part of me restored. Mm. I want to have that part of me more developed. I want to go back to Iran and actually experience the country um, how it was and even better than it was and better than it ever was. Mm. You know, we don't need the Paris in the Middle East. We need the Tehran. We need the Iran uh, in the Middle East to be a beacon of light to the region and to the rest of the world because we are leading a leading feminist group here mm. that um, is something that even in the West we haven't seen. Some of the yeah. one of the things that it, it feels like the um, I, I I spoke about this in an essay about a month ago or, or or maybe a little more. But one of the things that the those brave young women and men in Iran who are fighting on the front lines, one of the things they've done is not just um, create the prospect of change in Iran, but they've they've um, created the the, the re, a, a rebirth of Iranian pride for those of us in the diaspora as well. Um, and I think of you, and I think about how you've been um, clearly moved by what's uh, happening in Iran. You you made the choice, um, I guess it was about a month and a half ago, uh, uh, to cut cut off your hair in solidarity with the women in Iran and those fighting yeah, three for months ago. It for, was like it's it's long enough. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell me about that decision. Tell me about how how where, what began with Massa Amini and in the days after that, as this grew from a, a protest into a revolution, how it moved you so? Um, I was actually in this room um, and I was, uh, I had COVID. So all of this, I was in complete isolation and just watching 24 seven, what was going on there. And, um, I, I think I was in a kind of shock, like so many people. Um, a shock to wake up to something that has been part of the 43 years of the tyranny, but never so blatantly and out in the open. Um, it was always, we knew it was happening in Avian prison for sure. We knew it was happening. Um, yeah, so, so I was in my room and I couldn't sleep. I was feeling awful because of COVID. And then I saw these young women cutting their hair. And I thought, I, I have to make a big statement, something drastic that, that shows my support. Not just I stand with the women in Iran, but actually, you know, doing something. And so I thought, why not do that? you know and i glammed myself up because i uh i felt that um you know i'm i'm not on the streets i'm 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 actually here i'm i i'm not pretending like i am them but one of the things that uh, uh, uh iranian women are known for is is the glamorous side mm -hmm. i think iranian women are just the, pretty much the most glamorous women on the planet and um, so I thought, I'm going to make myself pretty for this. Um, and because uh, I'm not out in the streets protesting that they, they hadn't happened yet. I think I missed the first protest because I had COVID. And then uh, and that was it. Yeah. You you're on the cover of my New York magazine for this month. <laughs> you're the December cover cover woman. You, you, you've you said, I, I never imagined gracing the cover of a magazine this way. What, what part of it feels surprising for you? Well, I was always hoping that I would cover the, ma uh, the magazine in a very glamorous way, hmm. you know, like 
with the hair wavy and beautiful and you know you look great on um, the cover i don't know i don't know what we're comparing this to you look and at, here i am like ah. yeah you you it's an activist kind of cover is that the yeah no it's it is actually much cooler than a glam shot you know but i think um you know for anybody out there i'm now owed a glam shot <laughs> okay oh, tell me about this um uh this international emmy awards a couple of weeks ago um with the women life freedom written it was just below your neck and you had it in persian on your back right on your skin i'm so yeah. curious about the I, i'm curious about the the decision to do that and then um the reactions that you received yeah so um i i i was in the jury of the international emmys and um i knew i i had to go on the red carpet and um with everything that's going on right now it feels it it, it just doesn't feel right to go out there on the red carpet and say oh look what i'm wearing you know um it it didn't sit right. I almost said, um, "I'm sorry, I'm sick. I can't come, or I'm not available, or something." And then I thought, "Oh no, that's a good platform. So why not make the red carpet um, a, um, a a moment of protest that um, you know could flawlessly work in that way?" And I I tell you, I've never been received so welcoming. Um, other than when I'm with my husband, obviously. Um, but I went up to the press person and I said, um, yeah, I, I um, you know, I, uh, I want to walk the carpet. She's like looking, am I on the list? Yes, I want, was on the list. And then she sees the woman like Freedom mm. right here. And there were about a hundred people. And, and those, I have to say, were people who were nominated <laughs> and you know, there were prominent people and I was an unknown to her. She took my hand, whisked me past those hundred people that were lined up around the corner to the front of the line. And within seconds, they announced my name. Mm. So that showed me the level of support from um you know that particular person but also the press they were they, they were like oh this is great mm. you know because i think it must get boring after even for them was it you know, was it like, was it in los angeles was it hollywood where, where no it was in new york in new it york. was in new york and mm -hmm. and and what was this did you get a sense of um i mean obviously you felt the support did you feel did you get a sense of we're a couple of months in at this point a couple of weeks ago uh into the revolution so uh, but one of the things that we lament sometimes in the iranian community is the lack of consciousness or support etc from the west did you get a sense that people knew um at least the folks who were attending this uh, emmy awards were aware of of exactly what this meant yeah, I mean, I was there with mostly the German delegation and um, they, um, you know, from the film funds in Germany and, and, and so on, and they all knew what was going on. Um, I, I don't know about the Brazilians because it was really international. There were so many people, but most people that I met and one of the moments that happened that was amazing. So um, I met Ava DuVernay, um, you know, legendary Ava DuVernay and she looked stunning like a mm. empress and um, you know she was very stoic and she looked at me as I was being introduced um, by um, who was it you know the person um, uh, who, who was running the whole show and she looked at me and then she saw my woman life freedom and this big smile on her face and she said i'm with you sister i'm mm. with you oh, that just gave me goosebumps you know and um uh, i had a few of those encounters um with celebrities and um at that event and that was really heartwarming nicole you must be uh aware of the the actors and directors, your your sisters and brothers in the same industry uh, uh, in Iran who are um, on the front lines of this revolution, some, sometimes unwittingly, they can't help but be, uh, um, and some of whom are bravely, you know, posing without the hijab, for example. Um, are you in touch with any of those folks? Um, are, are you um, uh, aware of, of, of their, what's going on there with, within the acting community? 
Um, I am aware because of the other Iranian women that I work with here. Um, they, you know, we just did a protest performance yesterday at um, this gallery in New York City, and they um, welcomed us with open arms um, and said, you know, whatever you want to do. And uh, I'm not going to say names because um, uh, most of my sisters are um, have family in Iran, so I can't mention any names, but I'm in the know about what's going on in Iran because of them. Mm. Um, and um, they are all so brave and so incredible. And I, I, I bow to all of them. From a personal perspective, can you imagine, um, you know, if you were there, do you have a sense of whether of what you would be doing um, as as a, a <laughs> go ahead? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm sighing because I, I I do look at that and um, I I'm very I'm I'm somebody who's really afraid of physical violence. I shy away from I'm, I I get claustrophobic in groups. So for me to go to the protests is really overcoming a fear that I have of being squished. I don't know why, but. Um, I have some ideas, you mm. know, but 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 I'm not 100 percent sure. So um, I don't know if I would be on the front lines like that. But if I had grown up with this and and I had to live, you know, for decades being oppressed like that i think there is a moment where it is no longer a choice mm. like it is no it's not a choice for me to spend all my time literally doing everything i can to bring awareness to the situation in iran because i have plenty of other things i could do and should be doing i'm delayed everywhere but it doesn't feel like a choice it is a must you know a, mu a, a, a needs must, I think it's called. Um, so I what I see with the young people in Iran is that they have no future. Mm -hmm. So I think where, if you are at that point where the desperation is so high that you would rather risk death and, and see your friends dying, and mm. still be standing there. That shows you the level of desperation and the level of oppression that they have been living with. And that is so heartbreaking to see. Um, so I do hope that I would be as brave as they are, but I'm not sure. You know, it's that that question that, that every German asked, hopefully asked themselves, what would I have done? Yeah. You know, during that time, what would I have done? Yeah, I mean that. Um, I have to be honest, whether it's appropriate or not, I, I can't speak to necessarily. But uh, that analogy comes up a lot these days. You know, uh, um, in terms of wanting people to to not be silent or sit on the fence when it comes to Iran, uh, talking about Germany uh, half a century ago or more, and and and. Um, complicity and and silence and all of that. Uh, these are these, these are tough questions. You talked about heart. You used the word heartbreaking, and in that quote I read of yours at the beginning of uh, our chat here, um, you talk about that 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 mixture of feelings of um, of the energy you feel that this revolution is coming and the hope and the excitement, um, but the the heartbreak as well. And and of course, on the way to change, um, if it is to come, and we all hope and perhaps expect it is, uh, there's there's a lot of heartbreak and there's a lot of um, devastation and, and just horrific daily news coming at us. Um, how sad have you been in recent weeks? I mean, uh, I, I guess nothing compared to people who live in Iran, I think, um, or people who were born in Iran and moved away. Um, defected but uh, maybe there isn't maybe we shouldn't even uh, put ourselves and pin our own sadness against other sadnesses um, I, I've been as, as sad as they come um, 
what this whole thing has unraveled for me as well, of course, is my my father, who I was very, very close to, who um, was Iranian. He passed away um, a year ago, only oh, a year ago. I'm sorry. So to see all of this happening without him being able to witness it is it makes me tear up now. And, um, you know, seeing and meeting people who... Um, I, I've met a, a lot of people who've lost their fathers for some reason. Me too. Who were Me too. I lost yeah, my da- I lost my dad, and I every day I think about how he would be um, observing this right now, and I think he would really be energized by what's happening. You know? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. But I I I solace myself with the idea that all those who have passed are needed on the other side Mm. because i think um in order to um get a get a successful revolution completed you need all the help you can get from all the levels of existence including those who have passed um i believe in that and um and i think a lot of good people are passing because uh we are in the shits all over the world. This, on the one hand, on the other hand, we're seeing a shift that is so radical and and so beautiful. Hmm. So we are. Um, I'm excited to be be alive at this time. One of the reasons I asked about heartbreak, Nicole, is that um, uh, you're a yoga therapist. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but <laughs> but I have to imagine that it includes some sense of how to try to navigate and how to try to try to maintain some balance in in one's life. And for those of us dealing with the the trauma of and and you you correctly said there's nothing like being on the front lines in Iran, but the trauma of watching the horrific events in Iran each day and scrolling through our social media and 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 experiencing insomnia because we can't stop thinking about the devastation and hoping that things can change. What is your personal prescription to finding some balance in moments like this? Uh, I do two things. I meditate um, every day. And um, I uh, I work out. I do less kind of yoga and stretching these days, although I do a little bit every day. But um, I I used to do much more. Um, but what I do these days is um, throwing things, boxing, you know, like stuff to to get the anger out um, uh, a lot. Um, my plan with actors rising is um, to actually create a space and maybe half in person, half on Zoom, or um, I, I don't know yet, I have to find time to set it up. What I would like to do is actually help people in the diaspora um, uh, to uh, to lead some, um, uh, you know, uh, workshops, moments where we can come together and meditate um, I did this whole intensive workshop with my one of my teachers, Guru Dharam, who is incredible. He's a shaman. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Mm. Um, and uh, he led us through this meditation, uh, really on a meta state, where um, I encountered um, the revolution <laughs> again. And something was resolved in that meta level and I took it back to the level where we exist on and I thought I want to do that with people because it can only reinforce the 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 resolution and strengthen what's happening on planet earth and especially in Iran um, so that the um, uh, so that it's manifested so that it actually goes through. So, um, yeah, watch the space. I, wow. I, I do want to create that. And I'm also looking for an Iranian-speaking uh, yoga therapist um, so that uh, they can do that for people in Iran. Wow. Um, that's that's an amazing story. Can, can you, 
I don't even know if the, what, what the ethics of this are, but can you visual? Can you tell me what the what you visualized when you saw the revolution? Well, it was I. I didn't want it. Uh, I actually wanted to go up into this angelic space. <laughs> That was my idea, you know, I wanted to go into this angelic space and see what's there for me. And um, I don't want to go into uh, into total detail because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it, it was my vision and yes. um, I, I don't want to project any of my vision um, to other people because my vision might not be your vision. Yes. Um, but basically you go up into... Um, in, in, into a world where you meet your power animal, etc. And then in the upper chakras, you go to a space where the ancestors and the ascended masters live. And um, just to explain this, um, uh, there, there was an intrusion of people that I don't want in that space. Mm. And I was able, and you know who they are, um, mm. and I was able on that level and without blinking an eye and this is why i knew it happened and it wasn't my choice it wasn't like me going oh i'm a warrior and I'm, i can do this it just happened the moment i saw them i kicked them out and they were away from that space which was a sacred space um and i think um that, you know, when you look, for example, at the success of Hitler, and there are many books written on this, like he he had kind of like a spiritual group around him. He was actually working with shamans in India who used the, the you know, the, the Hakenkreuz, you know, who used, used the swastika, which when you turn it is the sign for the sun. So the sun sign, when you turn it, becomes the opposite, becomes the darkness. So that's how they were able, with black magic, to reinforce the message of what, you know, what he went out to do. Um, you know, with the final solution, yeah. uh, what they called the final solution. Um, the elimination of, of all Jews and 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 LGBTQ people mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, you know disabled people, mm -hmm. um, other abled people, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, from that point of view, we can do the opposite. We can create a space that is so pure and so righteous and so good and so peaceful and bring it here so i i wasn't planning on going into that but but you asked well, thank me you about no i i think for a, <laughs> a lot of folks out there this will this will resonate and be really interesting and your 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 idea i mean i i don't know where i'm at on it but but the but the, the idea that there is more after this life and that your father is there um it, i i have a a beautiful vision as you're speaking of 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 all of those martyrs that we've lost in the last two or three months, especially the young, the young people, the the Nikon, Sarina, and Kion, and Khudanur, and uh, all of them. The, the names we know, Mayor Shad, Massa, um, that um, that they're all there some somewhere, that and that that we'll be able to visit them. Um, that's a it's a beautiful vision, Nicole. Yeah, yeah. Um. I think we shouldn't limit ourselves. Mm. A, a final, I mean, question to you. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, your your husband, uh, Brian Cox, he's, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. I'm sure everybody is uh, of uh, Succession and uh, and and all of his his work. And but I saw him on an interview somewhere. I don't think it was about Iran, but then he started talking about Iran, and I remember thinking, "Wow, oh. he's so impressive and informed." And I remember telling my friend, uh, "That's because his wife is Iranian and she's cool, and she's all of this this stuff." Uh, d is that true? Do you do you do you provide information for him uh, because he seems like he he knows what he's talking about when it comes to Iran? Um, yeah, I mean, he he does read the paper. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's my influence. 
I mean, there's nothing I t uh, else I talk about in the last three months. <laughs> and I'm sure it must be annoying for my family. Um, but um, yeah, he, he really is amazing um, in how he uses his platform and and um, his support um, of me personally, but for the greater good. Um, yeah, he is. He really is. Um, he's a great man. Well, he's lucky to have you, and um, we, we're um, we're lucky to have had you as well here for for a, a little bit. Thank you so much. I know you're busy. I know you're you're doing a lot um, for this. Uh, uh, this effort uh, for those of us in the diaspora and I, I really appreciate that and I really appreciate you taking the time today to be part of Rook. Mm, thank you so so much for doing what you do. I really appreciate it. Thanks Nicole. I hope we talk again soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Nicole and Sari Cox uh, in New York City. Thank you to her. Thank you to all of our guests and our uh, team for this show. This is full time for Rook for today, episode 221. Thank you to the amazing team who put this show together. Savvy Roham, talented Anahita, Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Alhaya Mehrdad, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please do subscribe if you haven't done so already. And you can support us and become a donor at rookmedia.com. Check out our website anyway, where you can see uh, previous episodes, all of the Uprising series, different programs, uh, funnies, videos, etc. It's all there, rookmedia.com. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizunbashi. Bye.